Hello everybody, I'm having another go at one of these Facebook live sessions. This time I'm joined by my producer, Zeze, she's normally behind the camera or under the camera snoring during these, um, but I thought I'd bring her along to check everything was working. So any technical problems, please get on the comments and let Zeze know and she'll do her best to rectify them during the broadcast. Other than that, I'm going to cruise on, um, hopefully make this one a little bit quicker today, but it's a relatively short session. Um, with a talk followed by any questions that come in during the live broadcast. Okay, so off you go back to sleep There we go. So she'll be the first to sleep with any luck during this talk. Okay, so today I wanted to talk about sh Shooting double exposures underwater It's a relatively old technique in underwater photography But it's one that we can use I think in really creative ways and I think it's actually a really interesting area of underwater photography because it's very underexploited still. I think there's a huge amount that can be done in this area. So today, it's not an area that I'm any great expert on, so today I'm gonna to cover the basics in the talk, but I'd really encourage you to, to get out there on the internet, read articles about it, see the way that you can push your camera in different ways. And one thing that I'll, I'll mention again during the talk is that the different cameras can create multiple exposures in different ways. So depending on the camera you've got, you've got different creative possibilities for the way you can create these types of images. So without further ado, I'll get my slideshow up and hopefully now this should get us going. Um, so please remember during the talk, any comments or questions, fire them in and I'll read them out at the end. But I'm hoping to get this wound up um, a little quicker than other days. Right. So double exposures. Why are they interesting underwater? Well, I think they're interesting um, these days because they can really allow us to create a very different type of underwater picture. Sometimes it gives us a little bit less control, but that can often be quite interesting. I also think they're useful for underwater photographers to learn to do because I think very few techniques challenge you to be so precise with your exposures, with your framing, with the way you're lighting pictures as this, these techniques. And as a result, it can, create, it can make you really take control of your pictures. So even when you're not shooting double exposure, you can get pictures that work out exactly the way that you want them to. So um, to sort of track back in time, my understanding of the situation is that the first person to shoot double exposures underwater, certainly the first person to sort of um, encourage others to do it too, was Peter Schoons, um, the great British underwater photographer, sadly no longer with us. And he came up with the idea of, of doing these underwater, really because he was shooting at the time a, a camera called the Pentax Alex. Um, and that film camera actually made it relatively easy to reload the film back in again and make sure that one series of frames was exactly overlaying on another and gave you the chance to do these shots. And he came up, as far as I'm aware, with this technique of combining a macro background, as you can see in this page here from um, Underwater Photography Magazine. This was the original print version, UP Magazine rather than UWP Magazine from 1987. And he was the first person I saw to create, or I was aware of, who created an image with this kind of macro foreground combined with a wide angle background creating you know a very dramatic almost unbelievable picture and this is created on a single piece of film so in those days sort of pre-photoshop you know really amazing to see this created on a piece of slide straight out of a camera and peter sort of debuted this technique at one of the uh, annual british underwater photography competitions called the splash in um, which was pictures taken on that day and was able to create this amazing look and it just obviously swept the board in the competitions. The technique then became incredibly widespread over the coming years and in fact underwater photographers certainly in the UK would joke about the fact that oh I actually won a competition without doing a double exposure. Um, the technique became so widespread. I think one thing I would say is I don't think Peter Schoon's ever claimed to be the originator of this technique underwater but I, I do think underwater photography was very different in those days and the world was much less joined up than it is now. So different people would often have the same ideas at a similar time in different countries. And they would often persist in those countries for a long time um, before anyone realized that someone else somewhere else in the world was doing the same thing. But certainly by the late 80s, early 90s, these techniques were incredibly widespread in underwater photography. This is um, Mark Webster's underwater photography book from around from the from the 90s. And you know this was sort of when double exposures were in their pomp, really and everyone was doing them all the time. And the picture on the right here of the, um, of the, um, the Parasoranthus or, or the, the polyps on the, on the right, 
um, taken in the, assuming the Mediterranean, is a classic double exposure technique where a macro foreground is, is exposed and then the film is reloaded into the camera and a wide angle background is shot behind it to create this very impressive naturalistic view on a single piece of frame. And actually, Mark's got some pictures on the other side of the page there, sort of showing the technique. If you look at the three line drawings, the top one shows him snoot lighting the, the polyps. The second one shows him doing a wide angle shot um, where the bottom half of the frame is kept in shade and the top half of the frame is, is lit, usually at the surface of the sun, makes for a good background. And then the final frame on, on, the, on, the, on the, with the line drawings shows how those are melted together. And this became a you know, really popular technique in underwater photography. But then by the mid 90s, Photoshop was starting to be really commonly available in underwater photography and creating an image like this in camera began to to lose its interest and also I guess the technique had been very overdone overused and it dropped away from fashion and people kind of forgot about it for, for quite a while and then in the early days of digital as I often do when I'm looking for interesting ideas to try underwater I, I looked through a lot of these old books old, old magazine articles and decided to sort of have a go at trying to do this on digital. And actually the cameras at that time had just incorporated features that allowed you to do this and actually allowed you to do it in different ways. And most digital cameras give you two different ways to create double exposures. One is by combining consecutive frames and one is by combining any two frames on the memory card. The pictures can't really be adjusted or, or rotated, but they can be blended in different ways. And that gives a lot of creative potential that I think has been very underexploited by underwater photographers. And this is an article I wrote in UWP magazine number 43 from, from August 2008 about shooting dig digital um, double exposures on digital. And this was very much using exactly the same technique as you would on film, but you had the advantage of being able to shoot a lot more frames and combine them. So you could take the pictures with a great deal more polish than perhaps was possible on film. So. As I was saying, most digital cameras give you two methods for creating double exposures and they can both produce the same results or they can produce very different results. Um, one method is to use in Nikon speakers, uh, uh, um, it's called image overlay, but it's got various terms on, on the different cameras where you can combine any two pictures on the memory card as you, as you find them. They both need to be on the memory card and they both need to be in the same orientation. So when you're shooting, you need to think about really the orientation and leaving space for the two parts. So the, the picture on the left here I took in Norway uh, many, many years ago, and it's just a picture of a, of a hermit crab with a, a diver behind. The diver was taken on a wide angle dive. While shooting some wide angle, I shot some silhouette wide angle backgrounds, knowing that I could later combine them with macro foregrounds. Um, and that's how I produced that picture there. The picture on the right is taken with the other method where you're actually shooting two consecutive frames as a multiple exposure um, to, to blend the pictures. Or actually you can shoot more than two frames, which is actually what I quite often do. Set it for three or four frames um, and, and, and build the picture up, particularly the background. So I'll do one shot to get a really nice foreground. When I've got that good foreground on the first of two shots, I'll then shoot my background. And in this case here, my background is again the surface of the water, but this time shot out of focus with a macro lens. And what I'll tend to do when, when doing these shots is I'll practice both shots beforehand, memorize the settings for each. And then when I've got a good foreground, I then know, right, now I need to turn my flash gun off. Um, I need to make sure I'm defocused in this case for, to create these, these bokeh blobs as the background. And then I just point the camera at the sun, remember what settings I used before, dial them in and, and zap a shot and try and get a good background. And actually one of the nice things about doing this with a multiple exposure is you can actually shoot a few frames until you've actually built up quite a nice effective bokeh if you happen to miss them. Um, there is not really any advantage in doing it one way or the other. I would say that the image overlaying method of taking any two pictures from the card gives you much more control and it would be the normal way of doing it. Occasionally some competitions don't allow image overlay, but there are also plenty of competitions that don't allow any form of double exposing. Um, but there are some that maybe allow multiple exposures as opposed to, to the overlay. But there is, apart from that, I don't see much reason for doing the two. The downside of doing the multiple exposure is as an underwater photographer, you can't change lens between the frames. So as a result, you're stuck, unless you've got a good big wide zoom range in your lens, you're stuck with a similar lens to create the different effects. Now, I, I quite like that effect with the, with the backgrounds um, in terms of shooting macro backgrounds to complement a macro foreground. But if you want the classic macro foreground, wide angle background, 
you need to use an, an overlay effect on, on digital cameras. So this is kind of the, the, the process. These are pictures from that original UWP article talking about how to, to create the picture. You kind of need to divide your frame into two halves. And for a classic shot, shoot a wide angle background with a dark area at the bottom of the frame and some interest and depth at the top of the frame. And then a macro subject at the bottom of the frame with lots of black space above it. And when you overlay them, the black doesn't block out the other image and the two images blend together really nicely. What is good about this technique of doing it in camera is it does, I think, give a blending effect that would be a lot of work to achieve in Photoshop. If you look at the fin of the triple fin in the zoom in shot I've got on the right of the frame here, you can actually see the reef through the, 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 the filaments of the, of the fish's um, fin. So you've got a very natural blending effect. If you were doing that in Photoshop, there'd be a lot of fiddly work to get such a nice natural blending effect. I think the other thing about doing this in camera is it can give you some surprising effects, which can often be graphically very eye-catching. So that can be a nice thing to incorporate in a picture. Okay, next slide. Um, I think another way that double exposures are used a lot in underwater photography is to create a very naturalistic effect that a lot of photographers don't realize are double exposures. And this is particularly common in, in the Mediterranean, in, in photo sub type competitions where photographers must capture the images as they were. And one of the problems, the challenges of diving in the Mediterranean is all the rich color is often very deep, sort of below 30 meters, below 100 feet. And at those sort of depths, you can't get beautiful sunbursts. But the Mediterranean is often very calm. It's often sunny in the summer. And it's a great place to shoot sunbursts. So what the photographers often do in that situation is they shoot their colorful wide angle foregrounds at depth. And then when they come up and they do their safety stop at the end of the dive, they then shoot their sunbursts and then blend them together using these overlay techniques. And this is quite a nice over technique to keep in your mind. If you ever want to dive and you find a great subject, but it's not in the right place to get a lovely sort of sun background, and there's great sun on the dive, you can combine the two. This is a picture taken in Raja Ampat while diving the passage. And um, there were some beautiful sun rays coming down through the, the trees, but all the subjects in that nice sun rays were all occupied by all, all the guys on my workshop. So I was there going, there's beautiful sun rays, but I haven't got a subject. So I, I shot some sun ray shots. And then once I had those in the card, then went off and, and could then find any macro, any wide angle foreground I wanted, shoot it with an inward lighting technique to just light that subject, nice fast shutter speed to get a dark background behind it. And then the two pictures will overlay very nicely together like this. Right. The other sort of classic technique to go for is this the macro with a background effect, either a macro with a wide angle background. The picture on the left here is quite amusing. I, I shot the background for this on a trip to Canada many years ago, and then I kept that picture on my memory card. And when I was diving in Norway um, a few months later, I then shot the nudibranch in the foreground. Obviously, this is biologically a very corrupt image with Pacific bull kelp and a Atlantic nudibranch. But um, it was fun to combine the two pictures together just for the, I, I did this really to show the effect that you can, you can use pictures as long as they're both on the card, they don't have to be taken at the same time. Um, you can also do things like change white balance between the two. I was shooting double exposures the other day in the UK. We had very green water that day. So what I did is I tuned my white balance so I got a really nice blue watercolor background and then combine that with a correctly white balance foreground um, subject lit with a snoot. And again, that was a nice way. So you don't have to have the same white balance between the two. They'll blend as the camera sees them. And then the other shot here is with a, a macro background created with, with that bokeh effect I talked about earlier. I think an interesting area for double exposures is with patterns. And actually you can do not just one exposure, but several in a row. I tend to do these shots with the multiple exposure where you just go zap, zap, zap and see what you get straight away without having to combine frames. Um, and this works well with lots of textures. Coral textures work really nicely. The two examples here is a fish school. Um, multiple exposures on fish schools give you sort of multiply your number of fish that look quite cool and create really nice movementy textures, which I think are quite interesting. And then the other picture is the detail of the, the karata on a, um, on a nudibranch, on a janulus nudibranch, and just a multiple exposure of that. So combining, um, taking a couple of frames of the same pattern, just moving the camera slightly between the two to create kind of a, a more abstracty pattern. Um, it's not a picture that I necessarily like, but I think it was quite interesting it was to, to try this technique. Um, I just put this picture, and this is a, a picture that was on the cover of the, the UPY yearbook from this year, taken by, by Mock. 
And this is a picture taken with an, with an image overlay technique. Um, this case combining a, an above water portrait of, of Mock's wife with a beautiful coral seascape all in, in black and white. And this is using um, a feature on the Canon for adding pictures together. Uh, I think it's called additive blending, where actually white areas in the picture um, can, can mask over the picture. And I think this is really effective as a shot. I like how the white background around the model has blurred out the coral and the coral just comes through. And I think this is an area that you can really create really interesting images in. And it's just sort of a peak that, you know, this is a picture from UPY this year. You know, for us, we felt was a really groundbreaking, really original image. And this is just tip of the iceberg of what can be achieved. So I think this is an interesting subject to cover in today's talk. Okay, I'm going to swing over and try and answer any questions. So if anyone has any questions for me, fire them in in the comments below this video and I'll read out any comments and questions until I run out of comments and questions and then we'll wind this one up today. Okay, Hannes. Hi Alex, first time I managed to wake up for one of these. Probably asleep already, I would imagine. Um, Zeze is fast asleep down there. I'm pleased to report those who are here at the very start. But thank you for joining us all the way from Mexico. Hope you're okay over there. Andy. Hi, Andy. Can you copy raw files that you captured an earlier time from your computer onto your memory card and then do an in-camera overlay? So, Andy, you've got the same camera as me. And yes, you definitely can. However, for a Nikon camera anyway, the file naming format needs to be correct. So if you, like me, rename your raw files when you download them, you need to give the raw file the same name as it has on the camera. So my camera raw files are like called AAM, because those are my initials, underscore, and then some random number. When I download them onto my computer, I put a, a more specific file name on them. When I want to make image overlays, I need to rename them in the AM format. It doesn't actually have to be the original file name, but it does have to be in the same format, and then the camera will recognize them. Um, the cameras can read each other's raw files, but I don't know what would happen if you put a D850 file into a D5. I know if I put my D850 card into my D5, I can see the files on the screen, but I've never tried doing an image overlay. So I think they probably have to be shot with the same camera. Right. Hopefully that answered that one. Hi, Mark. Any lens preference for double exposure? So I think to create the space, it's actually good not to go too tight with your macro lenses and too narrow with your wide angle. The wider the lens is, the more space you've got, because ultimately you're actually trying to photograph a, a subject usually within half the frame. So you actually don't want to be filling the frame, but you want to get lots of black in the picture. So I'll generally set up, with, say, if I'm shooting full frame macro with a 60 mil lens, aim my snoot so it's lighting the subject, but keep my subject down in the bottom half of the frame. So it's actually, I'm not going for that much magnification. And then in the top part of the frame, I'll again shoot the wide angle, but I want the, the, the light from the sun and the silhouettes to all stop by about halfway down the frame at least the bright parts of the exposure, again, so the overlays nicely. So the wider the lens, the better. There was something else I was going to say there, um, and I, f I forgot about lens choice and exposures. Um, might come back to me. Um, my lens, I'm um, also asking another question about lens choices. I think that wider the better is definitely the, the way to go with lenses. It makes a really big difference. Chip, do you ever cover part of the lens to create a black area? Um, theoretically, it could be possible. I think Paul Colley wrote about this in his book that he actually made a, a mask for shooting split levels in two goes. So he could shoot a split level with a blacked out top half. Uh, I think it was using an old um, lens hood. Paul often joins us for these, but I think he might be away at the moment. And then he would rotate it around and do the other half. And that way he could have very precisely framed and exposed top and bottoms for his split level pictures if they, the line was in the middle. Um, but I've never tried that. But you definitely could, anything that's going to give you that control. And I think that's one of the things as an underwater photographer you can get out of this technique is it really will teach you to really take control over your pictures and over the frames you're shooting. Uh, yeah, yeah, all cheated, Marco, all cheated. Um, so Marco's question there is, um, thanks for the presentation. I never realized those photos were double exposure and image overlays. Yes, it's an interesting technique, particularly for on the day style competitions or, or your shootout style competitions. It, these can be really interesting ways to make your pictures a little bit different. And the the ideas I've suggested today are very much the tip of the iceberg. Um, 
Um, Tanesh says it has to be the same camera. Thank you. So, and maybe even the same individual model if you have two of the same body. I don't know how, whether that would allow, but that's that's good information. Again, all the ha cameras and models are a little bit different in what they can and can't do. Um, and my experience, I've not massively experienced with this technique, and I have only done it really with my own um, Nikon cameras. And C3PO, um, nice to have you here. Um, Greetings. Um, right. I am going to wind things up now because I have got a meeting to go to in a minute. But thank you everyone for joining me. As always, the video will be available on Facebook to watch back. So if you add comments to the picture or as you're watching this back, if you're not live, I will get on there and try and type some answers in. I'll also upload this video onto YouTube and put it there. Anyway, bye-bye from me. Bye-bye from Zazer. Um, it might be a couple of weeks till I get back to do another one of these. Um, we're hoping to go on holiday, um, see Elio's family soon, so I won't be able to tune in and do one of these. Okay, bye everyone.